any questions Please from this morning or any thoughts, Please any yes. any uh, any comments? Uh, if you want to throw tomatoes, I don't care. Just take them out of the can first. But just, <laughs> is there is, are there any questions that somebody that, that we have? You weren't up here. You yeah. weren't even here. Oh. Nope. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, just let us quickly recap. This morning we found out that uh, that there are uh, five words for prayer, and those five words are uh, diome, uh, which means to beg, to beseech, or to make a plea. Parakloa, which is to call near, to invite, or to invoke. So when we're in a situation. And we really need the Lord, and we pray in such a way that we say, Lord, we need you to come in to our situation. We need you to come into the church. We need you to come into our prayer meeting or whatever it is we have. The other one is Jesus, and that's the one that we mostly use, and that's one where we make a petition to the Lord. We ask the Lord, we have a need, and that need can be spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. It could be family, work. It doesn't matter. The Jesus prayer is where we go to him and we say we have a supplication, we have a need, and we ask you as our Heavenly Father uh, to help to fulfill that need. Amen? Amen. Amen? And the last one is the word prosuke, and the word prosuke means to worship. Mm -hmm. So when uh, we found out that out of 184 times that God mentions the word prayer or pray it or pray or pray, mm -hmm. Out of 184 times, 123 times, God was saying that he didn't use the word to ask, he didn't use the word to interrogate, he didn't use the word to invoke or to bring close by, he, he used the word for prayer that was to prosuke, which means to worship him. Yes. It means to make him the number one focus, and I don't know why the King James writers used the word prayer for prosuke, but... They did, and we're stuck with it. So as long as we study the Word of God, as, as Paul says, study to show yourself approved, mm -hmm. a workman, rightly dividing the Word, so that we're not ashamed. Yes. And by, by ashamed, that means that in the end, we're not going to stand before God and go, oh, 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 oh. I didn't know, right? Because we searched the Word and found out what that Word is. And so it's hard to be something when you don't know what's expected of you. Amen? Yeah. And we used the example earlier on. I wasn't here, but we used the example earlier. Uh, if you have a five-year-old child, it's no use going to your five-year-old child and saying, go clean your room. If he has no idea what, what, what clean means or whose definition of clean, that kid can walk in there. It looks like a cyclone hit it. Well, hang on, I mean uh, north. It looks like a hurricane hit it, right? And to him, it's clean, right? He knows where all the toys are. They're everywhere. But whose definition of clean? So what a good parent will do, will take that child and take it to the room, show it what to do, maybe have to do it four or five times, but after that the child knows what, what the parent means when he says, go and clean your room. We're asking God to teach us how to pray the Bible way, not how to pray the Western 21st century, you know, somebody's high on crack prayers, right? Because the way that we pray now, it's all about us and nothing about God or very, very little about God, right? 1 John 5, 14 says that, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and verse 15 says he hears us, sorry, uh, uh, finishes there, but in verse 15 says, and if he heareth us, or hears us, we know that we have the petition that we have asked him. So how can we go to God and ask him for things if we're not even sure that what we're asking for is in his will? Right? Paul says that you have, you, you have, son of a gun. Right? <laughs> oh, God's talking. <laughs> so, uh, you know, how can we know what we're asking for if it's in the will of God unless we first ask God, what is your will? Yes. And then uh, in, in, the, in the book of John chapter, I think it's uh, 14, Verse 12, I think, he says that if you ask anything right, in my name, I'll give it to you, right? But that, I know, that's verse 13. But verse 12 says, but you've got to do the works that I do. Yeah. You know, and he, he said, you know, uh, uh, the works that I have done, 
you will do also, and greater than these shall you do. And because you do that, you can ask anything in my name, and I'll give it to you. So if I'm not doing his works, why would I think I've got the right to ask anything in his name? All right? Like the woman who touched the hem of his garment, and she just went there and touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. And some of us, you know, like there's something wrong with us. We take out our ATM card and we go to the ATM and say, Oh Lord, let this ATM touch the hem of your garment. <laughs> you know, and we want money, but, but have we done the things that God has asked us to do during the week, but we're still going to go to him and ask him for whatever, right? right. So that's, those type of prayers don't help ourselves and they don't help the church. And everything God does, including what I'm trying to tell you, is everything that God does is for his kingdom. Even when he gives you a blessing, it's not actually for you. You're the recipient of the blessing and the, 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 the steward of the blessing. But if he was to give you $10,000, it wasn't because he's sitting up in heaven saying, you go girl, here's $10,000. That's not what he does at all, right? If he gives you that $10,000, it's because he trusts that you will find out what he wants you to do with that $10,000 for the kingdom of God. Right? And so all of our prayers are focused on the kingdom of God and the prosuke part is that we're taking our prayers and focusing on the king of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So you can, uh, does that, has that kind of caught you up? Has that reminded you about the things that we're talking about? Okay, praise God. So seeing as you're all a bunch of cowards and don't have any questions, <laughs> I'm going to quickly uh, go to where I left off earlier and the rest of this should go fairly quickly and then we're going to spend some time and honestly you know if we're here until 10 o'clock 11 o'clock it doesn't matter if we're getting closer to God and God's getting closer to us and we're seeing lives change demons are cast out and people get uh, uh, miracles of healing what does it matter time belongs to God anyway right amen, amen. amen. So it doesn't really matter how long it takes. Oh God, I'm so tired. I've got to get the kids off of school. You know what? Seek first the kingdom of God. He'll take care of the kids. He will. Right? Amen. 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 All right. So where we left off, uh, uh, what I wanted to tell you about, when we pray in Prasuke, if we go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, ta-da! Look at that. She's quick right now. She's been at the school all afternoon. Right there. Right? It says this. Be careful for nothing. But by everything, sorry, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made unto none, not, not unto God. What do you think that that word prayer is? Worship. 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 worship right. So in in, a, in uh, it, it talks about in everything with worshiping and asking. See, I'm not telling you you can't ask. if put the worship first. Right now, where it says uh, in verse six, be careful for nothing. That word careful doesn't mean like, well, be careful what you do. Now, as we know, that word is anxious. We only get anxious when we want something to happen, but we're not quite sure it's going to happen. Right. Right? So we kind of like, that's what we want to happen, but I don't know if it's the will of God, or, or, or I don't know if God's going to give it to me. And all. So that's when we get anxious. But he's saying, don't be anxious, worship me, and ask me, and I'll take care of it. Huh? So our worshipping, our prosuke in God actually eliminates that anxiousness. Why? Because when I'm in his presence and I'm worshipping him, that other junk doesn't matter. Because that's not with me in his presence. At that point, it's just me and him. It's like when a husband and wife, when they get married, on that wedding night, it doesn't matter whether the family likes the bride or the groom. It doesn't matter whether any, uh, people like the family or don't like the family. That's irrelevant. On that one wedding night, that all, and I'm sure we've got to deal with it later, but for that night, it's between the husband and the wife. And doesn't the Bible say that we, the church, are his bride? Yes. yes. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense to you? Yep. Okay, so in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says this, um, and I really wish that you know, Paul had not have said this, but he did, so i got to read it anyway. He says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. That's the part that I hate. Patient in tribulation. Who, who He did not know what I was going through, right? But this is the guy that was shipwrecked three times. If Paul ever asked you to go fishing with him, don't go. Because right? the dude was shipwrecked three times, all right? It's, it's not safe for you, right? Fish from the beer, but don't go with Paul. So he says, patient in tribulation. And then he says this word here. It's rather, rather unique. Continuing instant in prayer. 
Guess what that word prayer is? Worship. Worship. Now, continuing instant in worship, I, you know, I used to think, okay, God, you're going to have to explain this to me. What do you mean by continue instant? Continuing instant means looking for opportunities all the time to worship. Uh, it means that something happens, you can instantly think, I'm going to worship. I lost my wallet. Well, before I go looking, I'm going to worship. Right? I lost my job, or I can't find my car keys, right? Or it doesn't have to be something bad. It could be, hey, I'm going out to the beach, you know, or you guys don't have a beach, what am I talking about? Um, uh, so I'm going out to the mountains and then I go put my Daniel Boone hat and go look for a raccoon or something. I don't know. Whatever it is that you guys do up in this area here, I have no idea. This is only my third or fourth time in this area, so suck it up. Right? So, but before we do that, I, I'm going to find a way to, to worship him, even if it's just for a little while. Right? That's what he means by continuing instant in prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, he, he says this, and, and this one had me really stuck for a really long time. He says, praying always, or, or, yeah, always, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praying always. How the heck am I supposed to pray always? Like, when I understood prayer meant asking for things, how am I supposed to ask for things always? I run out of things to ask after a while. But I can always worship. Because that praying is worship. I can be worshipping while I'm doing the dishes. I can be worshipping while I'm shaving. And I've got to, because when you've got this face looking back at you, you better love God with everything you've got. You know, because you've got a razor close to your neck sometimes, you know? But... You know, I can do, I can worship Him in every area of my life. And it doesn't have to be a worship session. It can be just for that time while I'm driving down the road. If I've got nothing else, I can just spend that time just worshiping. I can be driving by and seeing the beautiful mountains. So what a beautiful place this is. Well, this reflects how awesome my God is. You see, even things like that are acts of worship to God. That's why when Paul says, praying always with all prayer, again, Worship always with all worship and supplication, which means that I can ask. Right? He says this, but and, and in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and listen to this, supplication for all the saints. So I'm not always praying for me. I'm praying for the saints. I'm driving along, and this happens to me a lot because I'm on the road a lot. I'm driving, and somebody's face will come into my mind. Just out of the blue. I'm not thinking about where's, where's, he's not even here, is he? Oh yeah, there he is up there. I'm not thinking about Rob while I'm driving, but all of a sudden Rob's speaking. So God put Rob on my mind or on my heart or gave me a picture in my head because either Rob needs prayer or Rob's you know, going through a lonely time or maybe Rob needs a phone call and stuff like that. So that if, if, if the Lord says call Rob, my calling him is an act of worship to God because I'm taking my worship for the saints. Wow. Remember how we said before, Peter was in prison and the people were praying for him. Yes. And because they were praying for him, God sent an angel to get him out and bring him to him, yes. to them. Right? So we can pray, and he says, praying uh, 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 and a supplication for all the saints. Amen? Yes. James 5, 13, uh, 13 to 14 says, we are to pray when sickness strikes, right? Look it up there. It says, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That pray is worship. That pray is getting down and saying, though I'm feeling bad and you are my healer, whether I feel healed or not, I'm still going to worship you. I'm being attacked by an enemy, and I know it's the enemy attacking me. He's sitting on my shoulder and beating my brains in. And though he's doing that, I'm still going to worship you. Hallelujah. Because look at what he says. Is any man afflicted? You know, uh, that, that afflicted doesn't mean sick, as in like sick in the body. That afflicted means that I've got demonic realm, or I've got this, this thing attacking my mind, or you know, I've got like issues in my heart, and I don't mean my physical heart, but I've got issues in my life that I'm dealing with. That's what afflicted means. It means that there's something on me that's weighing on me. Let him pray. Yes. Is any man merry? It's not always about when things are bad. Sometimes it's about when things are good. Right? right? Let him do the same thing. Let him sing songs. Yes. Right? Can you see what I'm saying? Amen. 
And listen to this. There's Jesus, Doxa, and Prasuke. Jesus is, our prayer is preoccupied with our needs. Because remember, Jesus is one of the words for prayer. So when we Jesus with God, that is, I have a, a preoccupation at this moment with this issue or with this need. And that's, so Jesus' prayer is being preoccupied with me. Right? Doxa prayer, uh, uh, doxa, it just means a form of glory, or doxa can also be mean as praise. When I praise, I am preoccupied with my blessings. Desus means I'm preoccupied with my needs. Praise is I'm preoccupied, and the word preoccupied means just at the forefront. So when I praise God, I am at the forefront of my mind is my blessings. I'm thanking Him for my blessings. I'm thanking Him for the fact that I don't have any blessings. But I'm thanking Him for those things. But prosuke is I am preoccupied with God. This is I'm preoccupied with my needs. Praise, I'm preoccupied with my blessings. But worship, I'm preoccupied with my God. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Amen? Now, Remember, Peter was the one in Matthew chapter 16, that's not, that's not on there. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter was the one when, when Jesus said to the disciples, okay, whom do men say that I am? And the disciples go, well, some of them say that you're, you know, that you're Isaiah, and one of them say that you're one of the prophets, and they're all telling what people say. But Jesus said, okay, that's fine, I did ask you, whom do men say that I am? But let me ask you, who do you say that I am? Who do you think of? You've been with me for at this point in, in Matthew chapter 16. It's been almost two years that, that the disciples have been with Jesus. So Jesus, you've been with me two years. Who do you think that I am? And Peter pipes up and goes, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answers him and says, Blessed art thou, Simon of God, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, what rock? This revelation that you have of who I am, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God, the Risen One. He ain't even though He hasn't been risen yet. Based upon what you know of me, I'm going to build my church. He didn't say go and build churches. He said, I'm going to build my church. Now, I find it funny that the one that Jesus said to him, that he got a revelation of who Jesus is, is also the one that he's the guy that wrote this. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, he says this, But the end of all things is at hand. Small uh, backstory here. Peter is about to die. He knows he's about to die. He's in prison. He's about to lose his head. All right, There's going to be some daylight between his head and his shoulders, and that's really pretty fatal. So he is going to die, and I don't mean he died like that, it's just the same. So here he is, he's going to die, and he says, but the end of all things is near. In other words, I'm going to die, so the, this is my last letter to my people, and so when we, uh, we know that when someone is dying, the last things they got to say is pretty important, wouldn't you say? Yes. In fact, it's so important that if a person confesses of a crime, or says that they have witnessed the crime on their deathbed, it is actual properly it is actually counted as proper evidence of guilt or innocence in a law in a court of law. So now Peter's about to die, and these are his last words. You would think, with all the things that he had seen, all the things that he had witnessed, all the people that he prayed for, all that has happened, he's got a lot to say, but he narrows it down to two things, and he says this. But the end of all things is at hand, and he says these words. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Guess what that word prayer is? Prosuke. He says, be sober. In other words, clear your mind, get your thoughts together, and watch unto prayer. Watch unto is a Hebrew, uh, uh, a, a Hebraic phrase, uh, phrase, sorry, and it means look out for it. Look out for opportunities to pray. Look for opportunities to worship God. Look for opportunities to pray for one another. Don't wait for them to come to you and say, can you pray for me? When I'm in the presence of God and I'm worshiping <coughs> God and saying, God, you're amazing, God, you're wonderful. And then some, and then brother, what's your name? He goes, uh, uh, duck, no, no, duck is someone. Uh, who, 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 That's your one. Huh? Jim, yeah. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. 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 Speak English, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jim. 
My name's Jay. How do you spell Jay? You say it. Can you spell it, Jay?
the lake owners are throwing at you. You know, and asking questions by the end of this time. But seriously, that's how we know. There's not two different gods, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. He's not the one God of the Old Testament and somehow become three gods in the New Testament. He's the same God. He just revealed himself in different ways. Amen? Amen. So if we just learn how they learned and how they learned was through the Old Testament. Amen? So to, to earlier on, we talked about the New Testament. Now we're going to move on to the Old Testament. First of all, I want to tell you a story. There's three fishermen, right? Three, three little Jewish fishermen, and they're in a boat, uh, a, a dinghy. I think they call them a dinghy, right? Just a little tiny boat with a little motor, and they're out in a uh, in a lake, and they're out fishing. And these three guys have got physical issues. One guy, he's so blind, he's got coat bottles for you know, for glasses, right? And another guy, his knees are shot; they're just no good. And another guy, he's back is really sore. And they're sitting there fishing and they're complaining about how bad things are. Oh, I can't see nothing. Oh, my legs are always hurt. My back is killing me. And so God decides to, you know, to come down and he says, you know, he says to one of the angels, I know this is not biblical, it's just a story, folks. It's just an analogy. So he says to one of the angels, go down there and fix up their problem. So he shows up on the boat. They're all stunned out of their brains. This is angel, this big old dude sitting up there. So he walks up to the first guy with the coat bottle glasses. He said, what do you want? He goes, man, you know, I can't see nothing. Like, I can't even see the, in the water. And the angel goes, bing! And all of a sudden, his eyes are clear as he's just a young child. And he goes, oh, look, I can see way over there. And he's really happy. And he goes up to the guy with the bad knees, you know. So said, what do you want? He goes, man, my knees are always hurting. So he walks up to him, the angel goes, and he goes, bing! And his knees go, oh, wow, I got new knees. And then he goes up to the guy with a bad back and the bag, and the guy with a bad back says, don't touch me. I've got, uh, what do they call that, uh, uh, disability. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> he was willing to live with pain because he was more interested in the temporal than he was in what God wanted to do in the eternal for him. And sometimes what we do is we, I don't want to let go of what I know because, because God might, and he wants to give us more than what we know. He wants to, he, you know, he's heard our prayers. You know, I've got to tell you something. Most of our prayer meetings, they're not prayer meetings. You know what they are? They're complaint sessions. Well, come on, bro. <laughs> oh God, my wife, she's such a bad cook. She must think I'm a God because every night she gives me a burnt offering. That's not a prayer. That's, that's, that's a Anybody else. 
But worshiping him, that's a different kettle of fish. That's, that's taking time that has nothing to do with us and saying, I'm going to put my needs aside for you. That gets God's attention. Amen? Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, Abraham said, like, just again, backstory, God said to Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only beloved son, the one from Sarah. I need you to go up to, to Mount Moriah and I want you to, you know, to, to sacrifice your child unto me and uh, then I'll be happy with you. And you know that that wasn't something that he wanted to do. You know that wasn't something that he was looking forward to do. But to show you how much he loved God, he had much doubt in his mind, much doubt in his heart. He didn't think God was going to, you know, like, what's wrong with my God? He doesn't like a human sacrifice. But if that's what God wants, then that's what I'll do. I don't understand what he wants, but that's what I'll do. He gets his, his, uh, his open top leather seat donkey, puts his kid on it and everything, and he goes and grabs his servants and goes there, and they're at the bottom of Mount Moriah, and this is what he says. He says to the servants, you wait here. Me and the lad are going to go up and worship and listen to his words. And we'll be back again. Did, did, did you catch that? Amen. He said, God told me to kill my son. This is the son that he told me that I was going to be your father of many nations. I'm going to obey him. To God, that's an act of worship. And if I do kill him, God's going to have to raise him up because how else could I be the father of son of, of, of many nations if it's not through this boy? So his faith and his obedience was an act of worship to God. It's not the, like you heard me say, oh, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you. That's not worshiping. That's parroting. And unless you've got a big beak like me and feathers somewhere, you're not a parrot. You're a human being who has words. And if, and if you can't describe how you feel, and sometimes we can't because there's so much of, oh, I just love God so much, and I want to tell him, but I just don't have the words. So you know what I do? I break out in tongues and let my spirit do the talk. And boy, that's when my spirit and his spirit become united as one. Amen. Amen. And a hey, good boy. And Abraham, I wish I could get that out of the other one. Teach him, boy. <laughs> but God's saying that when when I'm that much into his presence, he can ask me to do anything. And I go, yeah, sure. Amen? Amen. Remember, me and the lad are going to go on worship. Now, that word worship, remember today we said prayer is worship. So what is worship? That's what we're going to learn today. The Hebrew word for the word worship is shachar. It's spelled S-H-A-C-H-A-H, -H -H, I think it is. Is it A-C-H? Uh, uh, S-H-A-C-A-C-H. -H. Now, this is what it means to worship. It doesn't mean this. It means to bow down. It means to prostrate yourself. It means to lay down. Where's that brother that was... He's gone. He took off. He just went, okay. As soon as he came in, he, I was watching, I was sitting there, me and, me and Rob, we were talking, and he came right around there, and he came and laid down here. See, that's what worship is. Is when you get down as low as you can, the only thing you can see is him. Abraham said, we're going to go down and prostrate ourselves before the Lord. Shachar means to bow down. It means to kneel. It means to crouch. It means to get down. There is a physical attribute that happens to our body when we worship God. Remember, what happens in the natural is only a mimicking of what's happening in the spiritual. Does, does, can, can you understand that? Yeah. What's happening in my spirit, in between me and him, my body can't help but follow through. Amen. <coughs> Whether you're on the, you know, on the, uh, on the uh, pew and you're doing this, you're not standing up. You're bowing down. You're crouching down. You're kneeling. You're laying prostrate. You're doing everything but placing yourself up where everybody is at the moment because at this moment... It's just God and me, and by the signs that I know of God, I have no, I have no choice but to get down low. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Okay? Good boy. Keep saying amen. Right? So Abraham's obedience to God was an act of worship in Exodus chapter 4, verses 29 to 31. But specifically in 31, it says that once they had seen the hand of God, they worshiped. Look at this. It says, the people were delivered, uh, sorry, believed. And when they heard the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that, uh, uh, and that he had looked upon their afflictions, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. This. Not this. This. Not this. This. Or this. Or this. Anything but being what I normally do. Worship is an act outside of what I normally do. Right? Huh? When they heard that God, or sorry, when the people believed, and when they heard that God had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon them, he saw where they were at, they couldn't help but bow down their heads. Do you see what I'm saying? In Judges uh, chapter 7, verse 15, uh, Gideon, he's just some kid hiding in the wine press. <laughs> He's, he's threshing corn in the wine press, and an angel shows up out of nowhere and says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And he's going, who me? He's hiding. But God saw something in Gideon that was that even Gideon himself didn't see. And when the angel showed up and called Gideon what he was, not what Gideon saw, but what Gideon was, there was something that happened in him. Look at that. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, because after God had called him a mighty man of valor, he started seeing things that he'd never seen before. He started having visions of what God was going to do with him and for the nation. And God had all his interpretations. It was amazing. And it says this, and uh, therefore that he worshipped and returned into the house of it. He saw what God was going to do with him and for Israel, and it drove him to his knees. It said that he worshipped, he shachar, he bowed down, he crouched down, he knelt down, he lay prostrate. When we see God for who he is, God shows us what he's going to do, and all we can do is worship him. And any demonic realm that's trying to come upon us, the more time we spend in worship and the more time we spend around worshipers, the harder their job is to give us a hard time. Amen. Huh? Remember, angels, uh, uh, demons are just angels that have fallen, but they was, they're still angels. Right? So the angels were, sent, were up in heaven worshiping God they're not allowed to worship God anymore. They don't want to worship God anymore. We've now taken the place of the fallen angels and they're sick and tired of it because we are doing their job and we're going to get their reward. Amen. So of course they're going to distract you and do things to try and not get you to worship. Or even if you're struggling, get around worshipers. Can you see what I'm saying? Yes. We took their job and they are ticked. Yes. Amen? Come on. Can you say ticked or is that a bad word? Really? Okay. You know, I get in trouble sometimes, not in the English language, but, well, not like you guys talk. Okay. Um, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 2. It was, it was not just that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and also we are to enter and in at the gates to worship the Lord. The scripture says there, stand in the gates of the Lord, Lord's house and proclaim there is, sorry, there, this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye Judah, that enter into these gates to worship the Lord. We hear the scripture that says that we are entering into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, but to enter where the Lord is must take worship. Mm -hmm. Must take it. Amen. Yep. Amen. Must take it. Praise gets you into the gates. Yes. Thanksgiving gets you into the courts. Uh -huh. But to get into the holy of holies, yeah. we need to worship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> uh, hello? Yeah. I got you guys, right? I'm here. You're here with me? Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. To get to where you want to get. You see, prayers weren't answered in the gates. And prayers weren't answered in the courts. Prayers were heard and answered in the Holy of Holies. Uh, Amen. 
That's where the blood was applied. That's where sin was removed. That's where the thing that was keeping us away from God was removed. So now we have contact with God. Amen? Amen. Are you understanding there? What's your name, sir? Josh. Josh. Are you understanding what I'm saying, Josh? Yes. Good. Okay, praise God. Because you weren't here this morning, so I'm hoping I'm not sort of like, you know, overblowing your mind or something like that. Uh, Psalm 29 verse 2 says that God is due all worship in and to his name. David learned to worship while he was in the wilderness looking after his father's sheep. Seemingly unimportant, but God used this man to write the greatest books of worship known to mankind. Yes. A little kid started out looking after his daddy's stinky sheep. But he said, well, while I'm here, Lord, <laughs> and because of the heart of worship he had while taking care of his daddy's sheep, when he became king, that heart followed him. He didn't get a heart for God when he became king. He had a heart for God when he was in the wilderness looking after stinky sheep. Amen. If you can't get a heart for God here, you ain't never going to get a heart for God up there. Right. Amen. If you can't worship God in your wilderness here, you will never worship God in the heavens up there. Amen. 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 In Second Chronicles, uh, uh, verse uh, chapter seven, verse three says, "After they saw the mighty hand of God in signs and wonders, with fire coming down, that they bowed down." on the pavement with this. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, the glory of the Lord came upon the house. They bowed themselves down to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth. Can you see, every time you see something happen worshiping, where is the body? I have yet to show you, and, I, and you can search the scriptures. You know, every time I tell you something, I would love it if you would challenge me because the only way you're going to win is find it in the scriptures. Yeah. All right? Every time we see Shachar worship, their face was bowed. Their, their, they were on their faces. They were on their knees. They had their, uh, their, their, their bodies bowed down. There is no one... And I've searched the scriptures, believe me. You know, 20 years I've searched the scriptures, but I got this in 2015, so we're now... Eight years I've been searching the scriptures. I can't find one place where shakar, worship, is mentioned, and the body is not in the... Uh, and is in the upright position. There's not one. All right? There's over 800 uh, 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 instances of worship in the Old Testament, and not one says you can stand up. All of them have your body down low. Because that's where we find out how big he is and how little we really are. And our body cannot help but follow where our heart goes. Amen? Amen. If we look at the word worship there, Shachar, right? It is in the bodily position meaning to bow down, to depress, to prostrate oneself, to pay homage. To crouch, to fall down, to stoop. James chapter 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of God and he shall lift you up. Guess what that word humble means? It means literally to depress oneself. Not, I'm so depressed. That's not what I'm talking about. It says you are to depress. You yourself depress yourself. Notice it says in uh, uh, was it... Uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 7, 14, I think it is, it says, If my people yes. who yes. are called yes. by my name shall humble themselves yes. and pray, and pray, humble yourself. It's not my job to humble you, and it's not your job to humble me. Right? Right. He, he, even James said, humble yourself in the sight of God. Know who God is. You know, sometimes our pride won't let us humble ourselves. Amen. Come on. But if we know who God is, it's much easier to humble ourselves. Because you can't look, you know, like uh, in Australia, we have a big round building, and this is Australia, that crazy. We have a big round building, it's called Australia Square. Go figure, right? And when I was in Sydney, I, would, I used to work just down the road from Australia Square. And I would look up and I'd look at that building and I'd, dude, that's high. And um, my eyes 
could, I, you know, my mind could have said, nah, that ain't high. But my eyes said, you liar, look at that sucker. <laughs> it's so big, right? How can I not uh, have all at the, at the ingenuity and the manpower and the, the architecture and the material? I'm looking at that and saying, that is amazing. Now, if man can build something that I can stand in awe of, should I not? Also be looking at God and saying, there's no man that puts you up there. You're, you are there and always have been up there. You put me here. I have to bow down in your presence. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Psalm 95 verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. We sing the song, right? Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Can you see this, right? The word, uh, 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 the, the, the two words bow down there is a, is a one Hebrew word and it means karat and it just means to sink, to prostrate, to stoop, to be feeble or faint and let us kneel, which is the word barak and it means an act of adoration to bless the Lord our maker. I'm giving you scriptures so that there is no way you can walk out of here and say, oh, that was just kicky, was just spooking a bunch of stuff, something you learned from a book somewhere. Nobody taught me this. I got this myself. Why? Because God said, search the scriptures. Because in them is where you have your salvation. Amen. 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 Even nature itself teaches us what is right in God's kingdom. The animal kingdom recognizes the importance of obeisance. Right? You've got the king of the jungle, the lion, and all the other lions come up and they put their head there. The animal kingdom knows that, that there's one king and a bunch of subordinates. Mm -hmm. right? Wolves do the same thing. Amen? Elephants do the same thing. Even kangaroos do the same thing. Right? Because it's in their nature to humble themselves to the king of the tribe, the pack, the herd, or the mob. If, if animals know how to pay homage to their leader of their tribe, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with me that I can't humble myself before God and not just say, Lord, I humble myself. Anybody can say it, but getting on a dirty floor? Uh, <laughs> that depends on how much you like vacuum the church in here, but it doesn't matter. I worship God on, on the dirt road. I was praying it was two years ago. I, I, had, I, had my, I had my prayer sticker when I go for my prayer walks, and I was just praying, and I, I'm walking along. It was like it was, the sun was just rising up. And then all of a sudden, I just felt this this burden that you know for for somebody that I truly did love like crazy, and I couldn't stand anymore. I was walking, and I stopped, and I was praying, and I couldn't stand, and I lay down in the middle of the road. I had a friend of mine say, "Well, what if you die? Where do you think I'm going to go? <laughs> Hallelujah! Who cares? Right? I'm not insurance. My wife's taking care. Of. Shut up! Right? So." But sometimes he asks us to do this. Well, not even he asks us. We just realize and we don't say, well, I'll wait to get to church before I worship God. Then that means you're not humble enough to get in the dirt. You're not humble enough to get on the floor. You're not humble enough to get out of your car and sit outside and weep and wail or just t t sit there in awe of your God. That's what's keeping us away from getting most of our prayers answered. Amen? Amen. God has not asked us to do anything more or anything less than any of the Old Testament saints, right? We are to obey, give, serve, sacrifice, and worship in the same passion as they did. The New Testament church was, was just the Old Testament church after the Savior came and pointed us back to the Old Testament because that's where we were born. Does that make sense? All we are is a modern image, or should be, of how they lived. And look at what they did. If you if you read Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about the saints who have gone ahead. These people, they were sawn asunder. Right? They were locked in prison. They were killed. They were stabbed. They were burnt. They were, and all that. And had not having Christ in them. And they did that, looking forward to the cross. And here we are. With the cross in our rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. And we struggle to be like them. Come on. Come on. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? That's what, that's, that's, that's what we've accepted as church nowadays? Come on. Mm -hmm. Bless him, Lord. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call church. And we've really deceived ourselves into thinking that God is okay 
with this. Up until today, God was okay. But well, what's, what's your excuse going to be from today onwards? Because you won't have one. There is no excuse. Amen? Amen. Matthew 15, 22 to 28. This is now, now, now I'm going to explain to you what it means to, to worship in the New Testament. Uh, the Canaanite woman, you know the story of the Canaanite woman? Right? She, she's up from Tyre, up near Tyre and Sidon. She has a daughter, the scripture says she is grievously vexed with the devil. Right? So she's like the female version of that man who brought his son right, to, to Jesus. This is just, but she's not a Jew, she's a Canaanite. She's not even a, 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 a member of God's body. She hears, she's 300 miles away, people. She hears of a man in Jerusalem, who, a, a, supposedly a man of God, who heals people. She leaves her daughter up in Tyre. She walks, or maybe she was wealthy, and she had a donkey, and she rode down to find this guy. She asked, where is this Jesus? Where, oh, he was here. Where is he now? Oh, he's in this other town. She tracked him down into Jerusalem. She goes to him. She sees him with his entourage. She sees him with all the disciples and all of the Jews. She's a Canaanite who has no right to go to him. And she walks up to him. Look at the scripture. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She had no right to ask him, but she said, If anybody can do it, he can. Come on, man. Right? <coughs> and, all she went, and all she went by was by what she heard, yeah. not by what she believed. Come on. Sometimes God's trying to tell you the truth and He's saying, do something with what you heard. You don't got to believe right now. It'll all come in a minute. All right? Amen? The next scripture says this, but He answered her not a word. He ignored her and He was supposed to because Jews don't talk to Gentiles. Right? But what He did was, is he, he knew what's coming on. He was, he was Jesus, the Son of God, right? He knew what's coming on. And, and, and the disciples came and besought, her, and besought Him saying, get rid of her. She's, she's not even supposed to be here. And Jesus said, okay, listen, you know, I know what's happening, but you don't. You just want to get rid of her because she's a Gentile. Let's read the next scripture. Scripture says this. But he answered and said unto her, I am not come, or I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He actually confirms why he's not talking to her. You're a Gentile. You don't deserve me. Did she do this? Hold on. I don't know. I guess I've got to leave because, you know, he's not going to, he's, he's ignoring me. No. Look at the next scripture. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. A Gentile came and worshipped him. Now, that word worship is, remember I told you? Uh, the prayer is <coughs> prosuke. Well, worship comes from the word prosukomeo. Or I, actually, I should say from the word proskuneo. Right? Proskuneo. Remember that word. P R O S K U N E O. Proskuneo. Now the word proskuneo. This is now. Remember now. He hasn't. We haven't gone to the next section yet. Look at what he says. It is not meet for me to, uh, uh, to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. He just called her a dog. And I'm not talking about like you're, like you're from Chicago. Yo, dog. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. He didn't call her like that. Yo, dog, what's going down? What's it? Whoa, oh, hey, ho, ho. Whatever that is that they do. Every time I do, I look like I'm having a spastic attack or something. But, but, but here's the thing. Look at that sister. You know, my wife does the same thing. She does that. <laughs> but he called her a dog. And then he says, not only are you a dog, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to give you any of the food from off the table. How desperate are you for what you want? How bad do you want it? How bad do you want what you went to God for? How far will you go to find Jesus to get what you want? And even if you are rejected, how much will you stick to your guns? Amen. And she didn't stick to her guns but like, you're going to give me. No, she worshipped him. Amen. He said, I'll test to see how far her worship goes. So he ignored her, called her a dog, and said, see all this lovely food? 
Uh, none for you, right? And listen, look at what she says. And she said, truth, Lord. How are you going to argue with the king of kings and lord of lords? Yeah. If he says something, if he says, you're the ugliest duckling I've ever seen, and you go, yep, I am. <laughs> but you make it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, of course, you're going to agree with what God says. It's God. Huh? You're going to argue with him. You're going to lose. Right? So she said, true, Lord, yet even the dogs, even after all of your people have finished noshing and stuffing their gobs and food everywhere, that you will even let the dogs come and take from the, you know, the crumbs that are on the ground. And he goes, oh, this chick really wants something from me. She's really prepared to stick to her guns. Look at what the scripture says. Go next one, sister. Go ahead. And then Jesus answered unto her and said, O oh, woman, great is thy faith, and be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And, and her daughter was made whole from that same hour. Look at this. She, she comes to him, and she goes, help my daughter. He ignores her. She worships him and never asks you again. But yet he still answers the prayer. Mm. That's good. Mm. He, she desist him. Didn't get what she wanted. Jesus isn't working. I'm going to worship him. She never asked again. But that worship moved him to answer the prayer that she first asked him for. If you're asking God for things and you're not getting it, stop asking and start worshiping. As if God doesn't know you have a need. As if God doesn't know that your need is this or this or this or this. He knows. And thank you for telling him. But if you're not getting an answer, stop asking and worship. Come on. Yeah, that's right. That's good. And take what he tells you. Yeah. That's right. And look what happened. It says she was healed that very same hour. Now let me tell you where faith comes in. She, uh, he said to her, your daughter is healed. She's 300 miles away. Uh -huh. <laughs> She, her, her, her daughter is in Tyre. She's in Jerusalem. If you were to walk it, it'd take you well over a month to do it. Right? All the way home, she has no evidence that her daughter is healed. But she's going home. In fact, sister, can you go to the next scripture? I'm, I'm not sure if it says it in this one. No? Hang on. I'm getting impatient here. No, no, it doesn't say this one, but, but in the Aramaic English New Testament it says this. Basically what it was was that she didn't know until she got home and found her daughter sane and said to her daughter, when did you get better? And the daughter must have said something like, oh, about a month ago. What day? Oh, I think it was a Tuesday. What time? Noonish? That's the time Jesus said, go, your daughter is healed. She had to believe, though she didn't see, but she had trust in him while she was worshiping that what he said was going to happen would happen. Amen. Amen? And it was about a month before she found out. Sometimes when we go to God and we're praying or we're worshiping and he says, don't worry, I got this. When we come out, don't take it back again. Trust him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Another mention of someone coming to Jesus on behalf of the daughter was Jairus. He was, a, he was a synagogue ruler, and he had to swallow his pride in Matthew 9, chapter 18. I'm uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 and 19. The scripture says that this, this man's daughter came to him, came to Jesus. The scripture says that he went to him, and he bowed down, and he worshipped Jesus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. They hated Jesus. But he had to swallow his pride and say, well, Jesus has got this thing about healing people, so I better put aside what, what, uh, what, uh, what my other synagogue friends are going to say about it. My daughter is more important, so I'm going to bow down and worship this, this rabbi who other people say isn't really a rabbi, but I'm going to worship him anyway. Jesus saw that he was going away from what other people thought and worshipped him in front of those other people. And Jesus said, come on, let's go to your house. You see, his worship motivated God to do something. But he didn't worship him in secret. He came to Jesus in the street and said, you're the only hope for my daughter. Sometimes it's, you're the only hope for me. Sometimes it's, I've got this, this thing that's on me, these, these demons that are just constantly attacking me, and I can't see the breakthrough. 
Jesus, you're my only hope. Yes. yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And no matter where I am, whether I'm in a church or whether I'm in Walmart or in Kmart or Amart or ever in Old I don't care where I am. I'm going to worship you right here. And Jesus says, they don't care anything, but they want to worship me. And that's what motivates God to do something. It's not that we're trying to make him do it. He says, if you will bow down in front of all of this, then you can have what you're really seeking. Now, let me tell you, this I speak from personal experience. Let me give you a small testimony. When I, when I was born, I was raised as a Muslim. Right? I was born in Kuwait, raised a year in Kuwait, three years in Syria, four years in Europe, and then, and then we moved to Australia when I was a, a, a roughly about 10 years old, I think, I, I have no memory of my childhood from 14 years before, so everything I say is just what I've been told. So, uh, uh, you know, so I, I was born and raised in a Muslim family, raised as a Muslim, joined the Australian Army, got hurt uh, uh, several times, and then when I got out, I ended up on the streets, drug addict, alcoholic, I was schizophrenic, I was just not your normal everyday person, right? After I got busted by the cops, they sent me into the drug rehab home. It was an experimental drug rehab home. And so they were doing experiments to see how much they can get me off drugs. But after eight months, I got out. I'm back on the streets. I'm not using drugs. I'm not drinking alcohol, but I'm still crazy. So to me, two out of three is pretty good, right? So what happened was, here I am. I, I'm, I'm not sane, but I'm not a drug addict or an alcoholic. And one day, I remember I was a Muslim, so I was sitting on somebody's mailbox. And I was, it was five minutes to midnight. I remember this as if it was yesterday. Five minutes to midnight on New Year's Eve, I sat there and I looked up into the sky and I said, Allah, if you're really there, talk to me. Five minutes later, skyrocket. And I went, oh, God's to me. No, nope, it's New Year's Eve. That wasn't God at all. But, you know, the thing was, though, that he heard my prayer. 47 days later, I, I remember this, right? 47 days later, I met a man that I used to be in the army with all those years ago. I got discharged in Townsville. I left to Sydney and Brisbane and got crazy, but then I went back up to Townsville and I saw this guy and I was living under a bush. Right? Still homeless, but I was living under a bush. And this friend of mine saw me and he says, hey man, we you talking and everything. And he was in the Salvation Army when I was in the army and uh, I was a Muslim. And then when I saw him, he was in the Salvation Army before, but now he's got the Holy Ghost. And you know, like he's filled with the Holy Ghost. So he didn't tell me what that was. I didn't know what that was. I knew what Holy Smokes, Holy Mackerel, Holy Free Holies was, but I didn't know what a Holy, a holy Ghost was. So he said to me, he said, Keith, why don't you come to church with me? And I, and you know, and I've been to a couple of Catholic churches and by golly, I died of boredom in those places. It was insane, the things you gotta do, you know, bow down, get up, do this, bow down, get up. It was like, that's how you keep fit in the Catholic church. You can't be unfit in the Catholic church. You're doing calisthenics so every five seconds, right? So anyway, he says, come to church with me. And the only reason I went was because he was my mate. Hadn't seen him for a long time, so I went to go spend some time with him. And he took me to church, and it was a church of about 1,500 people. And there was Christians in front of me, Christians on this side, Christians on this side, and Christians over here. And where I come from, that's called kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get out of that place if the place was on fire. I was the only Muslim surrounded by Christians. And I thought, now I know how Muhammad felt, you know, for a little bit of a time. But then, you know, the, the preacher, he's preaching, and the message really touched me. But I didn't really understand it, but, you know, it touched me. And so he said, okay, now if you, want, if you want this Jesus, come to the front. So I felt to go to the front because I wanted to get this God that he was talking about. Right? So I get to the front, and I'm not kidding. I went to the front, and I didn't walk because, you know, the, the way he was presenting it was like a one-time offer. You know, you got five minutes to get here. I ran to the front. I'm knocking people out of the way. Right? I, I ran to the front. I got to the front, and he said, now pray. The only way I know how to pray is like a Muslim. Right? So, anyway, so I went, you know, and I, and I went to get down, and before my knee hit the ground, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Wow. I didn't even know what a Holy Ghost was. Next thing you know, I'm talking in tongues. I'm thinking, man, what was it? The juice could have had communion. You know? <laughs> the problem was, is that, is that I, didn't, I, I didn't take the juice because he said it was only for Christians. So I knew what I had was real, but I, you know, I thought, 
go, well, I'm talking like them wacky people are right now. But what I'm trying to say is that when somebody is, you know, is, is that desperate to get to God, that here I am, the only Muslim around 1,500 Christians. I only had one choice to get on my knees, the only way I knew how. And I didn't know what I needed, but God did. Amen. Amen. So when we get to God to worship Him, sometimes we have no idea what we need, but He does. Amen. 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 I know you're back there and all you see is back of me. And that's a better sign than what they got coming over here, right? <laughs> but God, the, 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 can you understand how important it is to, to worship Him? And Muslims get down to pray. I wish we would all get down like that. Right? They got a better understanding of prayer than what we do. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So, when it says, and she worshipped him, is the word proskuneo. The word proskuneo in the Greek, it means this. This is blowing your mind. It means to kiss like a dog licks its master's hand. Oh, I know that makes no sense. Let me explain this to you. She's got, <laughs> the look at she, she had a smile. Now it's like, it's like my mustache goes down. It's, you know, that's like that, right? So, it means to kiss like a dog licks its master's hand. Now, I'll tell you another little story. When I was, uh, it was not long before I came to America, I was in a car accident, and uh, I, I was, it was in a, what do they call it, a multi-car pileup, right? And my car was in the middle. I was driving in a BMW 321 or something like that. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. <coughs> and I was in a multi-car pileup, and I was stuck in this car. It was like concertina, right? And it took that fire, fire, we call it the fire brigade, what do you call it here, fire trucks, people, fireies, whatever, okay, that's what we call it. And it took them an hour and a half to cut me out. There was gasoline all around the place, and in the end I just said, listen dude, light a cigarette, I'm done, I'm done. My, 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 uh, my left lung was half deflated, my right lung was completely deflated, I had head injuries, all my ribs were broken, I was in a mess, right? But these people, they kept on working and they got me out, so I'm in hospital, I'm, in, I'm laying in bed, I was running away from God a lot, right? Because some bad things happened to me and I blamed God instead of the people that did it. But I was running away from God and God got my attention, right? So here I am, I'm in hospital, I've got tubes up my nose, I've got tubes in my mouth, I've got tubes in my arm. I had tubes in places no human being should ever have tubes. And I'm laying there and I'm messed up, you know, and, I, you know, and God said, do I have your attention now? <laughs> <laughs> he had my attention because I was running from God. See, I was a worshiper, but I let something else distract me from my life of worship. I let what someone did to me become more important than what Christ did for me. Come on. Come on. So I'm laying in the hospital, you know, I'm busted up, and the doctor comes in the next day, and he goes, Mr. Fancer, I got some good news for you. And I said, what? And he said, in about six to 12 months, you're going to be able to breathe normally. <laughs> and I said, this is good news? <laughs> and he said, yeah, and, and he's telling me all the slow things that I'm going to have to do, you know, to get better. And so that's when God said to me, if you'll come back to me, I want you to go back to America and preach. And I didn't want to come back here, so I said, I need to see some ID. <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? I did not want to come back here. <laughs> I'll come back to God, but you people are crazy. You're driving on the wrong side of the road. You're saying you're all for everything. <laughs> so God was telling me to come back here. I was running from God, but what, what was I going to do? God was doing that. So anyway, after about two weeks... I was able to go home and I had my dog. She was a big black Labrador. I mean, she was a huge dog. And me and her were like best mates. I was single at the time. And I would go everywhere. I'd go make a cup of tea. I had, at that stage, I had a walker, you know. And I'm walking, go make a cup of tea. And there was Abby right beside me. I go to the lounge room, there was Abby. I go to the bedroom, there was Abby. I go to the bathroom, I go stay. <laughs> you know. And, but everywhere I went, Abby was there. Right? I, and I started getting a little bit better and Abby was there, I'd pat her and everything. And when I would lay down, she would come to my hand and she would lick my hand. Right? Why, why did she do that? Licking my hand didn't help me. She was saying, you're my master. When I'm hungry, you feed me. When I'm thirsty, you, you, uh, you, you give me water. 
when I'm sick, you take me to the vet. You take me out to the park and let me play with my friends. You do all of this because you love me. And I'm going to be as close to you. And her licking me with, with her tongue, with her little tongue there like that, with her big tongue, that was her way of saying, you're the greatest thing that ever could have happened to me. So when this woman worshipped him, the scripture says she prostrated him. She made herself like, you are going to take care of my daughter. You are the greatest thing ever. And she bowed down and she loved him and she worshipped him. She did everything. And that's what God wants us to do when he says that we are to worship him. You know what? He feeds us. He gives us water. He clothes us. When we're sick, he heals us. He lets us come to church and play with our friends, right? He lets us go to, you know, to what we do. We come here and we play church half the time, right? But, you know, sorry about that. I mean, yes, I do, but never mind. Right? So, you know, but that's what God does for us. Why wouldn't we kiss like a dog licks his master's hand? It's because I cared for Abby that she loved me. Paul said, in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Abby didn't do anything for me to treat her like that. She's just a dog. But the, her response to my love for her was amazing. Our response to what God did for us shows more about us than what it does about God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's what it means to do that. To, to kiss like, like, like a dog licks his master's hand. The word worship is mentioned 91 times in the New Testament. 60 of those times it is translated as proscuneo. 21 times as latreo and 10 times as Sibo. When it talks about 60 times, it is, it is translated as proskuneo. It means that God wants us to be like a dog to his master. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Please don't take it like that. It means that a dog relies on its master for everything it gets. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Amen. <coughs> Many times we begin to worship. We quit when we don't feel anything. If you don't feel anything, it doesn't matter because it wasn't about you anyway. People, I've had people, I've said, how was church today? Or how was worship service today? Oh, it was a little bit dry. Well, I know who you went to worship. <laughs> Remember that Pharisee we talked about? And he stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> He said all the right words. He said, hallelujah, glory to God, praise Jesus. He's a wonderful Savior. He said all those things, but it was all about him. Amen? Amen. You, look at this. I, I got company. <laughs> <laughs> we quit way too soon because we're doing it for our own feelings. But the enemy hates it when we break through in worship because it brings so much joy to the Lord. You know how in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the scripture says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Remember how it says that? Yeah. And we think what that means is that God's joy becomes our strength. No, no. When we worship Him, we give Him joy. And because we're with Him, we get strength. I'm not doing it to get strength. I'm doing it to give Him joy. And as a result, I get strength. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Matthew chapter 8, verse 2. The leper came to Jesus. His hands, fingers missing, nose probably half gone, bits of body. This man with nothing came, the scripture says. The word says there. And while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler. Hang on, that's not the right one. Uh, boy, I tell you what, you're not your wife, are you? <laughs> <laughs> And behold, they came a leper and worshipped him. The scripture worshipped his proscuneo. He got down and as far as he could go, where else are you going to go? He's a leper. He has nothing to offer God. He hasn't got you know, a, a fancy church. He hasn't got nice clothes. He hasn't got money. He can give him every month. He has nothing. He has bits missing from him. Sometimes we won't go to God because our hearts are broken. We've got bits missing from our life. Those are the people that God wants to heal. Yes. yes. But he can't heal him if you don't go to him or worship him. Amen? Amen? And he says, if you will, make me clean. What's he got to lose? He didn't ask and then worship. He worshiped and then asked. 
Prayer and supplication. Mm -hmm. Prayer and supplication. Remember. That's good. Amen? Yeah. Uh, in Luke 24, uh, 51 to 53, brother, you don't have to uh, uh, do all those because I'm going to really quickly go through. In Luke 24, 51 to 53, the disciples worshipped him uh, uh, and after he was taken up into heaven. Matthew 28, 9. When, uh, uh, when, when, when greeting them after the resurrection, he, uh, they grabbed him by the feet and worshipped him. Remember, Jesus was resurrected. He shows up out of nowhere. And they went, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they ran and grabbed him by the feet. They said, we're not going to let you go now. You left before. You've come back. We're going to hang on to you. They didn't do that with his shoulders. They didn't do that with his hand. They did it with his feet. Amen? You got that so far? Matthew chapter 12, verse 11, the Magi worshipped him. Mark 5, 6, the demoniac fell at his feet and worshipped him, and the demons were cast out. Here's what I'm trying to say. If you've got demons, they will leave when you worship God. The, the, uh, the demoniac didn't come and ask Jesus to heal him. He just fell at his feet and worshipped him. And as a result of the worship, they left. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Amen? Praise God. Acts chapter 2, verse 25. Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet and worshipped him. He shouldn't have done it, but it was his heart attitude. Luke chapter 7, verse 38. The woman fell at, the, at his feet and washed his feet with her tears and dried them uh, uh, with her hair. In Revelation chapter 1, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 11, and chapter 19, the beasts and the elders all fell down at Jesus' feet. In heaven they're doing it. Why are we doing it? Perhaps because we don't have the revelation of who he is. Let me read, this is not in there, brother, but if you read the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John, the scripture says, and I, John, was taken up on the Lord's day, you know, to heaven, you know the story, and the scripture says, and I looked, and I saw a throne, and I saw one sitting on that throne. There wasn't three, there was one sitting on that throne. One Lord, one God, one faith, one baptism, one of it. And he looks up and then, and then he has the audacity to try to describe what he sees. And he said, this one that's sitting on the throne, he's looking, he goes, his hair was white, like wool. In his hands, he held the stars. When he spoke, it was like the sound of many waters, like the, the thunderings, right? Out of his eyes shot lightning, right? And, and his feet was like burnished brass. Do you know what the, what the scripture says that happened to John? He didn't go, wow, man. The scripture says, and I fell as one dead. Yep. Man. He just got a glimpse of what God was like. And he fell down. I think the reason why we don't fall at his feet like we're supposed to is because we don't really know who he is. Come on. If you want to fall at his feet the right way, ask God, give me a revelation of who you are. I know I can't take a lot. Just give me a glimpse like you gave to John. And when you saw him, you went, <laughs> Where did he end up? Not on the throne, at the foot of at the foot of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Amen. Our worship has a smell. Did you know that? Yes. Our worship has a smell. Revelations eight four. The smoke of the insects with in insects. Insects. Hey, where's Buck? There you go over there. Right. <laughs> right. The smoke of the incense, which is the prayers, the prosuke of the saints, talks about that. That when they were praying to God, it was like an incense to God. The worship was to God. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, the scripture says, And the woman with the alabaster box, she took that and it was a beautiful smell. Do you realize she was taking 300 days wages worth of this stuff? And she sacrificed it to God in worship. Yeah. Amen. And there was a smell that came up. That covered Jesus, but when she left, that smell was on her yeah. as well. 
When we worship God for who he is, when we ask God, show me who you are, and we get into the throne room of God and we sit at his feet and we just gaze up into those eyes and we just sit there, when we leave, that glory goes with us. And if you don't believe me, look what happened when Moses, when he went up to the mountain and he had time with God and, he, and God walked by and covered his hand. By the time he came down, he had to put a veil on his face because the glory of God came on to Moses. Right. Yes. You see, mm -hmm. I hope I'm getting this through to you. In John 4, 22 to 24, Jesus mentions worship proskuneo seven times in one encounter. And we can only worship what we have a revelation of. That's why when Jesus said, whom do I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And God said, you have the revelation of who I am. That's why he said at the end of his life, it is, it's all up and done with just do these, these two things because he had a revelation of who he was. Who, he could say, this is all he wants you to do. Look for opportunities to worship. Yes, sir. Yes. The one who had the revelation could write the letter. Uh -huh. The ones who have the revelation of who Jesus is can preach who Jesus is. Yes. The ones who have been saved can say, this is how you get saved. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense to you? We've come to rely on music and atmosphere in order to worship God, and these things are not necessary. Pastor, I'm going to uh, make a challenge for you one time. You do it whenever you feel. You pray about it. But how about one time you don't put any music on, and you just say to the people, just go to God, find a place, go to God, and don't get up until you've gone into the throne room and see what happens. Why do we need these things? We only need them because we don't know him the way he wants us to know him. If we need them, that means here. If we need him, that means we need him out there. We don't need to think of him. Man. This kid's great. You can come up here and finish the whole thing for me. Uh -huh. Amen? Our, form, our worship is a form of service to God. To pay homage to royalty is to bow down. You know when, when uh, the kings back in the day... When you walked up to a king, you couldn't go, hey, kingy baby, how you doing? <laughs> if you did that, you... <laughs> separation, right? There'd be air in there, right? It's not in a pipe, right? You'd be gone. What did they do? My liege, your majesty. And if we do that for human kings, why do we not do that for the king of kings? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Amen? I'm coming on. <laughs> Keep on going on. There is a warning though. Here, I've got I to tell you this. There is a warning. Jesus gave this warning in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. He said, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Okay, gotta go to church because we're gonna worship God. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hurry up because golden crowd's gonna close. <laughs> really? I heard how I love Jesus, but it was in vain. <laughs> Poor old sister Stephanie over there. She's holding her mouth because like half of everything's gonna fly out in a minute, right? You're gonna see that pizza we had earlier. <laughs> Jesus said this, but in vain, and the word vain there it means fruitlessly for manipulation, for folly, and to no purpose. It doesn't benefit us, and it definitely doesn't benefit God. Right? For in vain do they worship me? Sibo, misseeming devout or pretending godliness, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men or the endless repetitions of men. In 2 Timothy uh, uh, 3 5, we have this. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. We look good when we do this. When we do that, we don't look so good. But to God, it's the beautifulest, beautifulest, the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen. Because God says, I made her 
and she's taking her life and giving it back to me and doesn't give a rat's patootie what anybody else thinks. Now that has got God's attention. Amen? You got this, sister? Look at you. Good? Just nod. Let me know you're alive. Every now and then just do this, all right? Smile or whatever. Oh, you're moving your baby. That's okay. Says, <clears throat> our worship depends on heaven's rule that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2.10. So if every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess anyway, why do it now instead of doing it later? Because now gets us into his presence. Later we have to get admitted and then get kicked out of his presence. Yeah. You're going to do it anyway. That's right. You're going to worship him anyway. When Jesus was up in the mountain and being uh, uh, tempted of the devil, and after he finally does the three and tells them to knock it off, he says, listen here, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Right? And that is the scripture. He said that to, to Peter when Peter tried to stop him doing the will of God. But he was saying to Satan in, I think it's Matthew chapter 4, and he said this. He said, talking to Satan, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. See, Satan said to Jesus, just worship me. And Jesus came back and said, no, you're going to worship me. And not just that, but you're going to serve me. See, the devil hates it because he knows he's going to worship and right now he's still a servant of the Lord and doesn't like it. Anything that he does to us is either going to drive us away from God or drive us to God uh, uh, to God's feet. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is everybody seeking God's hands, but nobody's seeking His feet? Mm -hmm. Oh God, heal me! Yes, I need healing, but let me worship You first. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And, and you, everybody can desis. Everybody can eritea. Everybody can do your main. And everybody can paracleo. But not everybody can prosuke. Why? Because to prosuke means to put yourself down in order to lift him up. And pride won't let us do that. Not everybody can worship God. Because at that point, when you worship something, you've got to say that I'm less than that. And the reason why people won't submit to God is because they think they can do it themselves. Even in the church, we sometimes think we can do it ourseles. Amen? Amen? Second Corinthians, I'm almost done. Second Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is that spirit. Now listen to this. This is going to be very, very, uh, this is going to help you here. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's, that's what, but you know the original doesn't say that? In the original, if, I mean, if, even if you look at the King James, how many people here know that when you read the King James Bible, if you see a word in italics, that means it wasn't in the original. It was added for clarification, but it wasn't in the original. When you look at, actually, can you see up there? Okay, so you see, uh, now the Lord is the Spirit. It doesn't say, you know, the Lord is a Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord, right, is, there is liberty. Now, that's the NASB. That's not the King James. The King James says this. Now, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that is, is italics. There is, is italics. It's, it's liberty. But you know what that scripture says in the Aramaic? Where the Spirit is Lord, there, liberty. Oh, man. Mm. Wow. Amazing. You don't worship something that's not greater than you. The word Lord in the Greek is the word kurios, and it means creator, master, yeah. controller, owner. Where the spirit is my creator, he's my master, he's my controller, he's my owner, there I have liberty. Amen. That's good. Can you see? That's what God wants us to do. Make him, see, people want Jesus as their savior, but how many want him as their Lord? People want to get out of hell, but you get into heaven, they've got to have him as Lord. Mm -hmm. yep. people, want, people, uh, uh, people want Jesus to save them from the bad stuff, but they don't want to submit to him through the bad stuff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
The devil will tell you God doesn't care for you, and so you don't have to do that. But when you say, devil, I'm not listening to you, you're a liar, and you're the father of lies, then God says, I'm not going to take you out of this mess. I'm going to walk you through this mess. <coughs> and any devil that tries to go with you has to deal with me. Amen. And you see, every time we see somebody getting deliverance in God, every time we see somebody getting uh, uh, getting um, the woman who had the, you know, her back was like this, right? She had a spirit of infirmity. Remember we were talking about the spirit today? There's no such thing as a spirit of alcohol and the spirit of drugs. There's no such thing. But there is a spirit of infirmity. Infirmity means that you are squeezed on something that is not medical, right? And she had this demon on her back for 18 years to the point where it caused her to bow down. And Jesus said, told the spirit of infirmity to leave. And what did she do when she rose up? As soon as she was able to do this, she got down and started worshipping him. Why? Because the demon was in the presence of a worshipper and he had no choice but to leave. So if there's demons in this room today, if something, if something is on you, in you, around you, bugging you like crazy, you're in a room full of worshippers and this cannot stay here. If you want it, it ain't going nowhere. But if you don't want it, it can't stay in a room full of people worshipping God because the people that are worshipping God are full of Him. The only, the only time a demon can stay is if you want it to stay. If you don't want it to stay, you fall on your knees and we'll join you. We'll get down there and worship with you. We'll worship for you. We'll worship on top of you, around you, below you, through you. We'll do everything. If you want God, if you want God, worship Him because God and demons cannot live in the same space. That doesn't mean that the, 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 the demons can't be on or in believers because we are three parts. Where's the spirit? Where's the soul? Where's the body? And the soul is the warring ground. And the demons come and inhabit into our bodies, right? But it's the spirit that can't touch the spirit. That's God's spirit. The Bible says that when a man dies, his spirit goes back to God, right? But the soul is the warring ground. It, uh, the demons dwell in the flesh, but they're fighting for your soul. So if, you, if your soul says, body, shut up and get Get down. Now you have two things fighting for you instead of two things fighting against you. Amen. We can't just pretend anymore. You guys have gone past the point of no return today. You, if you go back to the way it was, it will get worse than what it was before. Jesus even tells a story. When a demon is cast out, he goes and wanders in the wilderness, finds no rest, and he comes back and finds the house that it lived in. And it's clean, and it's empty, and it's furnished, but it's you know, but there's nobody living there. So he goes and gets seven more and comes back, and the latter state of that man is worse than the first. Now that you know what you have to do, what are you going to do with it? There's more to come. You still got six, seven more days of this. So, you know, you guys better get lots of sleep and read your Bibles because this is, by the time I leave, if you guys aren't walking past the garage door and there's so much power in you that it's opening up on its own, I don't know what I've had before. <laughs> but if you have a problem in, in the demonic, you have enough of the Spirit of God dwelling in these people here that it can't stay on earth. I don't care. It can try to convince you that I'm saying junk or that these people don't know what they're talking about. We don't have to. God knows. That's right. Amen? Amen? So now what we're going to do is now we're going to put into practice what we learned. We're going to find a place to pray. We're going to find a place to worship. We're going to get on. Now, understand this. If you have body, if you have a body where you can't get on, you know, God understands. Don't feel bad. Right? If, if you can't get onto the the, uh, the pew and bow down, or you know, kneel, and you can't because that's fine. God understands. Do this. Do what you can. And God will do everything that He knows to do. Amen? Amen. So how about we do that? Okay, we got uh, do do we have any songs that are just real soft? Don't you know, don't go rocky and, and ripping and you know and, and Bouncing up and down. But do we have any songs that we can 
so we can see that it, just keeping it low so we can just hear it because right now you're not used to worshiping without music but you will get used to it if you want to right and now here's what i want you to do i want you just to go to god forget about everybody around you don't worry about everybody else's problem go to god for yourself first when I was flying, I've flown probably half a million miles, and I can tell you all the safety instructions. I, I can wrap them up like that, but one of them they tell you is that we're going to be flying at about 38,000 feet, and in the unlikely event that, that, that we lose cabin pressure, a cabinet will open up above you, and a mast will fall, take the mast, pull it down. This will start the oxygen flow, take the elastic, and place it over your own nose and mouth, and breathe first. And, and breathe normally. If the plane's crashing, you want me to breathe normally. <laughs> That's fun. Okay? So you put it off. But then here's what they say. Please, before you put it on an elderly, a child, or an infirm person, put the mask over your own nose and mouth first. Mm -hmm. Go to God for yourself first tonight. And then once you know that you stepped into that room, say, God, who is it? that I can take some of the precious presents that you've got on me, that I can go to them and share that with them. Is this making sense to you? And I promise you, if there's a demon in here, it ain't gonna stay long. If there's an infirmity in here, it ain't gonna stay long. If there's a disease in here, it ain't gonna stay long. If there's a mental anguish, if there's a spiritual problem, whatever it is, when there's worshipers in the house, those things submit to God. Amen? So please get up and whatever, and stay where you are, do whatever. But please don't be sitting there like bumps on a log. I've given you, a, and I've given you a, a way to break into the spiritual realm like you've never heard before. Amen? Now do something with it. And if you have to go someplace else, go ahead. Hallelujah.